Okay, it's 12. So we are gonna start our uh, webinar today. Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our webinar today. I hope you will have wonderful holiday next week. Uh, my name is Pei Shang Wen. I'm co-chair of um, ACIM's Complementary Integrated Rehab Medicine Networking Group. I'm a system professor at OT department at Georgia State University. And now I will ask Matt uh, Irv, my co-chair, to introduce himself as well. Yes, hello and welcome. You are mute. Sorry about that, I lost my mute. Welcome to Tech 2021. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Matt Erb. I am a physiotherapist out of Tucson, Arizona. I'm also an associate clinical director with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine based out of Washington, DC, and a co-chair with Peishan for these uh, webinar series. Our speaker today is going to be John Anderson and the topic of discussion is on neurofeedback. And we'll have a full introduction for John in just a moment. But before we get started, and as John gets his slides up, I do want to advise that this meeting is being recorded. And I'd like to ask all attendees to keep phones or uh, mics muted for those of you who are live. And there's, of course, many of you who will be watching this after the fact. Uh, we do expect to have a little bit of time at the end for discussion and questions. So if you have any, please type them into the chat feature and we will address as many of those as we can. And now that John has his slides up, one additional tip, if you haven't seen this, there is a slider bar between the slides on one side and the video feeds on the other. And you can move that left or right to resize the proportion if you would like to have a, a bigger view of the slide or of the speaker. And so um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Peishan. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. John began working with biofeedback and neurofeedback in 1974. John's clients have included children and adults with ADHD, learning problem, chronic pain, addiction disorder, and much more. John currently provides um, consulting service for new and existing neurofeedback program and work as an instructor, training others to become neurofeedback practitioners. John is currently working with BioSource software, developing online education tool for practitioners working towards certification in neurofeedback and quantitative EEG. We look forward to your talk, John. We will now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. I'm uh, happy that I was invited, and uh, I hope that we will have an interesting hour together. Um, as Peishan said, I'm John Anderson, and I've been doing this for quite a long time. And I have a company called the Minnesota Neuro Training Institute. And at the end, I'll show you the uh, link to my website. I'm also an instructor for Stens Corporation. And I also, as Peishan mentioned, develop uh, online training software for biosource software. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, neurofeedback and evolving discipline. Uh, it's been evolving for a long time. Uh, it, the interesting thing about neurofeedback uh, is that uh, it had some very early promise in the 70s and uh, even in the late 60s, and, and people were pretty excited about it. Unfortunately, it was uh, a victim of its own popularity because there were some popularized articles, for example, in psych Psychology Today that hyped uh, its um, reputation as kind of a panacea for all problems. Everything could be solved if you just teach everyone to produce more alpha. <laughs> and uh, of course, any serious researcher or clinician said uh, that's not likely to be true, uh, which was correct, it wasn't true. Uh, but we got stuck with that uh, mindset. And so uh, uh, 
it's been evolving in the background to some degree. Uh, it's not really considered a part of mainstream medicine or it hasn't been. It's becoming more accepted in mainstream medicine. And uh, there've been quite a few published research studies. Uh, there are probably uh, almost as many published studies saying that it doesn't work. And I'll touch on that just a little bit as we go along. So let's get into a little bit of a discussion about what it is. So what is biofeedback? Biofeedback is a process that enables an individual to learn how to change physiological activity for the purpose of improving health and performance. So what does that mean? Uh, we're trying to help the client uh, change their physiology, their behavior. And it's not a treatment, it's training. There's no input into the client. It's simply feeding back information to the client that then they can make use of. And we encourage them to move in the desired direction uh, towards greater health. And we'll talk about how we determine that a little bit later. Precise instruments measure physiological activity such as brain waves, heart function, breathing, muscle activity, skin temperature, and feed back that information to the user. So that's the information, that's the feedback. Uh, that's what the client is looking at. They're, they're observing the information. It's a bit like looking in the mirror. And it's a little, little bit like combing your hair or putting on makeup uh, while you're looking in the mirror, as opposed to not having a mirror and trying to do that uh, without the benefit of being able to see yourself. So the presentation of this information in conjunction with changes in thinking, emotions, behavior, that sort of thing, supports desired physiological change. Now, the goal of this entire process, whether it's general biofeedback or neurofeedback or whatever, is for the changes to endure without the continued use of an instrument. We want to give the client skills and abilities that then they can use in their daily lives on an ongoing basis that they don't have to have refreshed over and over again. Uh, it's simply uh, a, a skill like riding a bicycle. Once you've learned to ride a bicycle, you don't forget. Even if it's 20 years since you got onto a bicycle uh, with a very short refresher, you'd be back riding that bicycle quite easily. So uh, this is a skill building process and we'll talk about that more as we go along. Neurofeedback training is a component of biofeedback training. Neurofeedback training uh, provides real-time displays of electroencephalography, uh, the EEG, the electrical activity from the brain. And that's opposed to uh, EMG electromyograph uh, for muscle activity, heart rate variability, skin temperature, other physiological measures. Uh, all of those are very useful uh, and Neurofeedback is a part of that uh, environment of physiological measures and feedback. Uh, as uh, uh, working with the EEG, the brain directly, uh, we're looking at the electrical activity, which reflects the behaviors of the brain, the central nervous system, uh, the nervous system in general, the many interactive pathways throughout the body that make up the body-mind interface. So uh, one of the things that's, uh, just a second here. One of the things that's helpful is uh, that uh, the EEG can give us information about so many different factors in the system. And I'm gonna sort of use the system as a metaphor for the entire brain, mind, body interface. Uh, because the brain itself, the central nervous system, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists as an interactive communication and reciprocal command and control mechanism within the entire human system. Now, because I'm going to be talking about neurofeedback, I'm going to just mostly focus on using the term the brain or the central nervous system in this talk, but you have to re realize that it infers that communication and coordination and that broader body-mind interface and integration. And so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more toward the end of the presentation. So the brain activity measured by the EEG represents sensory perception and reception 
So sensory input comes in through our senses. It gets distributed to the parts of the brain that are associated with those areas, uh, those functions. It uh, integrates it uh, to some degree. It interprets it. It sends it to an integration area that then integrates it with other sensory input. So we might see visual input. We might hear audio input. We might experience temperature, um, tactile sensations by touching something and so on. And all of those inputs go to different parts of the brain. And then they have to be integrated and compared to each other. And then they also have to be compared to previous information that we've learned. Uh, and coordinated. And then there has to be error checking that occurs. And so all of this activity uh, goes into the overall command and control and coordination of our responses, and finally gets integrated into our memory system, into the retrieval of memory, into the retention of long-term uh, memory, and the reintegration of the new learning into previous memory. So all of this is, is what is reflected in the EEG as we look at the uh, scalp surface recording of the electrical activity. That's what's being shown is all of this interactive information. So for example, on the left here, we see a diffusion tensor imaging picture of some of the connections in the brain. This isn't a, an exhaustive image, but it shows a, a great deal of the connectivity in the brain. Uh, so there are a lot of neurons in the brain, uh, and there are billions and trillions of connections. And I'm not using those terms lightly. I mean that uh, literally. Uh, each pyramidal neuron can have somewhere between five and 10,000 connections. And each of those connections inter interacts with another pyramidal neuron, and so on. So there are billions and trillions of connections and all of those connections require an interactive communication system. And this is a picture of uh, what that looks like. Uh, if you're interested in diffusion tensor imaging, it's a, a subset of uh, functional MRI, and you can look that up. And there are lots of beautiful pictures on the internet uh, that show you what the connectivity looks like in the brain. And it's, it's quite fascinating. It's, it's really amazing to think of the number of connections that we have. So all of that activity that's going on has to be coordinated. This is an incredibly complex and uh, 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 diffuse system. And it has to be organized and coordinated and refined and refreshed and integrated and tested and retested. It's really beyond our understanding, um, at least at this point. We're, we're beginning to scratch the surface, but uh, we have a long way to go. Now, one of the ways that this system is able to exist because of the complexity, it needs something that will allow it to function on a sort of an automatic process, kind of an autopilot, if you will, and that's habituation. And we've been studying habituation for many decades, um, and uh, it's often called uh, Hebbian plasticity uh, because of the uh, originator of the concept, uh, Heb. And, um, one of the uh, comments was neurons that fire together wire together. So if uh, two neurons communicate with each other regularly and repeatedly, then the strength of that connection and that communication uh, is increased. And that happens that because of uh, new neuronal connections, particularly the growth of dendrites and uh, changes in the synaptic uh, characteristics of receptor sites and uh, presynaptic neurons, and all of these changes occur to increase or encourage the strength of that connection. So as we learn a new skill, uh, the brain creates new connections and strengthens those connections to embody, to physically embody those skills. Uh, and you could think of skills as habits as well. So the, the strength of those skills is based upon the strength of the uh, physical embodiment of those skills within the brain. Now, there's another component to that, uh, which we'll get to in just a moment, but let's talk about uh, habituation just a little bit more. So as I said, habituation is a component of learning. 
and the learning process requires repetition and feedback. We try to accomplish something, we get feedback, we try it again, we get more feedback, we repeat our success once we figure out what we want to do and how to do it. And that is when learning occurs and neuronal associations are created. So we're going to watch this uh, small child uh, learn to eat a banana. Now, the first thing he does is he uh, bites the peel of the banana. And then we'll see what happens. So he, he takes a bite of the peel. Well, that's not particularly tasty. And so he thinks, OK, so what am I supposed to bite? Oh, I'm supposed to bite that big round part. Oh, and that's that's really good. Let's have a let's have another bite of that. Let's try that again. We try and bite the peel. Well, that's not quite right. So we try again. Uh, we got feedback because when we bit that peel, it was kind of bitter. And so now we're biting the actual banana and the banana is tastes good. And so that's our feedback. And so we learn how to eat the banana. Well, uh, if it was a much younger child, they probably would have smeared some of that banana into their hair uh, in the process. And that might be kind of fun too, but it's not really uh, giving the kind of feedback that we want. So uh, the feedback part, the feedback part of this Hebbian plasticity uh, is one of the most important components of this learning process. So the Hebbian plasticity is just this linking of the two, uh, the pre and the post responses. But there's a third factor, and that is the feedback or attentional intervention factor where we get feedback. We, this is error correction, essentially. Uh, we get a reward, we get a reward prediction error, we get novelty, we get surprise. Well, he was surprised when he bit into that peel, that's for sure. Uh, we have a prediction error, we have a back propagation error. All of this contributes to long-term potentiation. And long-term potentiation requires this feedback step. This strengthens that communication pathway. That increases the synaptic strength of this communication pathway. So. Where did neurofeedback come from? What has neuro neurofeedback got to do with all of this? Uh, neurofeedback really came out of people saying, oh, well, you know, there are a lot of people who can do all sorts of interesting things like um, they claim to stop their heart. They can lie in a bed of nails without feeling any pain or discomfort. They can change the uh, temperature of their skin. They can uh, slower or speed up their heartbeat. Uh, they can go into a state of deep meditation, for example, uh, and they claim all sorts of other magical properties, but uh, we'll stay with the ones that are easily measured. So neurofeedback and biofeedback in general were designed or developed to operationalize the learning of these kinds of processes that people had already demonstrated. Uh, and it, it it has allowed us to identify the physiological characteristics of these states. First of all, by going and measuring people who uh, were able to produce these states. And that was a lot of that was done by Elmer and Elise Green at the Menninger Foundation in Kansas uh, many, many years ago. And they published uh, their research and uh, they went to India and hooked up these individuals and measured what they could do. Well, after that, they thought, well, let's learn how to measure that in regular everyday average people and how to train them to produce these states uh, voluntarily. And they developed something called the Voluntary Controls Project. And there's a whole history around that. So the, the measurement that we're doing uh, defines or identifies the physiological characteristics uh, of behaviors, for example, memory, uh, aspects of sleep and waking, and it allows for the recording, the display, and the training of those physiological characteristics. So the brain mechanisms that are involved in this process, we'll go into those now, and we'll talk about the hierarchy of frequency. Cross-frequency synchronization is one of the most important aspects of the hierarchy of frequency. Uh, we'll talk about organization and structure. Who's the boss? Who's in control of all this activity? The phys physical body and the central nervous system, are they really separate? Well, we've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, obviously, they are not. And how long does it take to learn a new skill, for example? So uh, 
the hierarchy of frequency. Now, this is going to be a, just a very, very, very brief overview, <coughs> excuse me, of, uh, of frequency information, what EEG frequencies are and what they represent. And the first thing you should probably do is forget everything that you thought you knew about EEG frequencies because it is probably wrong. Anything that you see in the popular press is almost certainly to be incorrect when talking about EEG frequencies because it's much, much, much more complex. Uh, alpha does not represent relaxation. Uh, teaching somebody to produce alpha doesn't teach them to produce a uh, relaxed state. Uh, theta does not re represent uh, meditation. Beta does not represent uh, focus necessarily. Uh, they can be associated with those functions. But one of the most important things to remember about EEG frequencies is that they are the reflection of behaviors that have already occurred. These EEG frequencies, this electrical activity that we measure from the scalp surface does not produce the behavior. It's a reflection of, it's the output of the behavior that has already occurred. So let's start with slow cortical potentials. Now the, the slow cortical gradient is a term that is that represents the electrical field of the cortex. So we have the cortex that has an electrical field either positive or negative, and it shifts more positive or it shifts more negative. And when it shifts more electrically negative, now this doesn't mean bad, negative is bad or positive is good. This is just negative and positive from an electrical sense. When it shifts more electrically negative, it facilitates the firing of pyramidal neurons, of cortical neurons. When it becomes more electrically positive, it inhibits the firing of cortical neurons. So with that mechanism, it provides a very, very sophisticated control and organizational function that can recruit large groups of neurons from across the cortex to do the same thing at the same time, to fire synchronously at the same time. And when that happens, uh, the emerging properties of that are the functions that we think of as cognition and memory and, and interpretation and, and uh, sensory processing and all of those. Uh, delta, um, now there's going to be some overlap in these frequencies, partly because there's differences of opinion about the frequencies and partly because there's historical uh, values. And uh, these days we more think of things in terms of just the numerical value rather than the label that has been given to that numerical value. Uh, but we still use the labels just because it's kind of an easy shorthand. So delta is somewhere between 0.5 and 3 hertz, maybe 1 to 4 hertz, somewhere in that range. And uh, it's associated with neurons in a, um, a synchronous firing mode that is also a coordinating mechanism across distances and allows for the integration or coordination of network activity. And then therefore the emergence of other activity on top of that uh, slower frequency. Theta is the same, it could be three to eight Hertz, four to eight Hertz, uh, depending on your source. Uh, alpha also produces this rhythmic pattern. Now alpha is one of the most distinctive and precise rhythmic patterns that the brain produces. It has a very nice sinusoidal rhythm, which means it waves up and down very nice and evenly. Uh, and so it has a timing function. And we don't have enough time to go into that, but the thalamocortical relay system, the relay system between the thalamus, which lives in the center of the brain, it's a paired structure, there's two thalami. And sensory input, anything from the outside comes into the thalamus and is distributed to the different parts of the cortex through different nuclei in the thalamus. So individual nuclei in the thalamus distribute this information out to the different parts of the brain. And that's a, a function of the uh, integration between the thalamus and the reticular nucleus of the thalamus and that interaction produces the alpha rhythm that we see on the scalp surface. And that provides this timing mechanism that we've been talking about. Uh, mu rhythm is a specialized uh, form of activity that's associated with the sensory motor cortex, as is the sensory motor rhythm. 
And then we have beta activity, which is that emergent property that results from the coordination or the synchronization of large groups of neurons. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. The faster frequency rhythms, high beta uh, and gamma rhythms are also those emergent properties that are the result of slower frequency synchronization. So uh, the frequencies are the representation, as I said, of neurons and the behaviors of those neurons that are influenced by multiple factors, chemical factors, electrical factors, metabolic factors, nutritional factors, drugs, for example. Uh, and other inter interventions as well. So uh, the slower EEG frequencies, as I mentioned, alpha, theta, delta, and the slow cortical gradient are oscillations that organize progressively larger aggregates of neurons. So as the frequency slows, there's a larger window. As you can see here, uh, the delta waves, this is a big window. So as the, the wave occurs, the uh, uh, peaks and the valleys of that wave provide a period of time, if you will, a window that's open for activity to occur. Uh, where uh, the alpha waves have a shorter window within which things can occur. So they can't uh, um, coordinate larger groups of neurons the way that the slower frequencies can. So the more complex the network, the more distributed the network, uh, the more complex the task being accomplished, the slower frequency needed to coordinate that activity. So uh, here's an example of a study that was done looking at the ability to retain a, a sequence of letters. And so the sequence of letters is here, H, B, O, C, T, P, E. And uh, each of those letters was associated with one wave of the gamma frequency cycle. That's a faster EEG frequency cycle. The entire sequence was coordinated by one of the theta cycles. So the entire string of letters was coordinated by the theta cycle. And superimposed on that was the uh, gamma rhythm that was associated with remembering each one of those letters. And so uh, here's another example of coordination. Uh, between fast and slow uh, EEG activity. Now, again, these are reflecting this activity. So here we have a slow network. Here we have a faster network. Uh, and then we have these various oscillations that are associated with those networks and the synchrony between these. These are phase synchrony indicators. So at this point here, and at this point here, we see that these wave patterns are synchronized. And when that occurs, then we have the opportunity for this uh, say, coincidence detection, spike time dependent interactions and so on that uh, represent work being done, uh, tasks being accomplished, the integration of uh, disparate types of sensory inputs, the ability to uh, uh, lay down long-term memories, the ability to coordinate the uh, comparison between incoming sensory input and long-term memory of what we are used to seeing, for example. And so all of these uh, behaviors are show up in the EEG. So who's the boss of the, all this activity? Uh, there have been a lot of theories that have been uh, presented to explain all this. And as humans, we tend to think that our conscious mind is in control, but of course that's not really true. Uh, our conscious thoughts, our ideas, our plans, our intentions, they have only minimal immediate influence. The things that we do on an ongoing day-to-day -day basis, moment by moment, that's mostly uh, governed by habit and learning. Uh, so if I got up every morning and I had to uh, learn to tie my shoes every single morning, well, I, I would never get anything done, of course. So I tie my shoes almost totally unconsciously, and I could be talking to my wife at the same time or doing some other task while I'm tying my shoes because that's become an automatic process. Same with driving a car. You drive from point A to point B. If you drive that every single day, you probably are doing multiple other things like talking on the phone, hopefully hands-free, um, looking out at the scenery, um, maybe talking to the person next to you in the car. Lots of other things are happening as your body and your nervous system repeat this habitual process. So to change this uh, requires a lot of exercise, 
uh, changing immediate responses requires attention. We have to pay attention. Okay. Um, uh, I know that some of the people in the audience are uh, occupational therapists, physical therapists, um, rehab professionals of some sort. And so you folks know better than anybody that people develop habits of behavior. For example, I worked in chronic pain rehab for many, many years, and I was fortunate to be around some great uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists who uh, taught me about posture, who taught me about sitting position, who taught me about standing position and how to attend to that. Well, before that, I had really not paying, paid much attention to that. So I had to learn to attend to that, to have the awareness of that on an ongoing basis, because otherwise I was slouching down in my chair and then my back would hurt. And so I had to learn to sit up straight and I had to learn to have good back support and uh, have my keyboard at the right level for my arms and so on. And all of this required this ongoing awareness that I had to consciously ref refresh and refresh over and over again. I had to get feedback. So, okay, I sit up straight. And I have the proper body position and my feet are flat on the floor and I feel more comfortable and I feel uh, my body uh, does better. And uh, I so I have to keep making the choice to do that over and over and over again until it becomes a habit. Uh, I need more feedback. Uh, as an ongoing process, I can't just forget about it and let myself slouch down again. And I have to make regular ongoing choices and maintain that level of awareness and attention, although not to the degree that I did at the very beginning, because now I've, I've uh, changed my previous habit into a new habit, and now I can uh, just run with that new habit, ideally. Uh, but, you know, down the road, I might develop other habits that are not particularly helpful. And so I need to be aware of that. And as we go through our lives, we learn these habits and they can be very, very, very helpful and useful and necessary, of course. But sometimes we need to change them because they cause us problems. Well, that's not only true for physical habits, but it's also true for habits of the brain. So, uh, there are lots of interventions that promote awareness and that help us realize, okay, we're not doing things the way we, uh, that's optimal for us. For example, psychotherapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, interpersonal relationships can do that if they're healthy. Any type of education where we're learning new things, uh, training in critical thinking, logic, fact-checking, healthy skepticism, training in self-perception, self-awareness, mindfulness, meditation, physical practices, yoga, dance, martial arts, Pilates, sports, skill training, musical instrument training, anything that encourages us to be aware, to learn new skills, to grow new dendritic connections in our brain, to rewire our brain, uh, all of that keeps us healthy and keeps us moving forward. So neurofeedback and biofeedback in general both provide this high precision feedback that encourages a level of self-awareness unmatched by any other mechanism, mostly because it's so fast. Uh, sophisticated instruments uh, provide information about activities that are going on that otherwise would be non-conscious, non-cognitive, and they do so at millisecond scales. We're talking about 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Before we're consciously aware of those events happening, it shows up on the computer screen. And by doing that, it gives us this accurate and nearly immediate information feedback that results in very fast learning because the trial and error process can be refined in real time. I'm looking at the screen and I've got sensors on my head, and I'm wanting to increase this particular EEG frequency. So I say, okay, uh, how do I know that that's changing? It's, well, let's say I've got a picture on the screen, and the picture expands or shrinks back down as my brain produces more or less of this particular activity. And so uh, instantly, as soon as I produce more of that activity, this picture on the screen expands and gets bigger. So my brain gets that instant feedback, and I can refine in real time because of that ability to error correct. And I can change that and learn much more quickly. That's that three-part learning model. Uh, and the, the third part is the G part that we looked at in that picture, which was the attention and error checking and awareness uh, component. 
So this level of clarity promotes a better signal to noise ratio that eliminates much of the uncertainty inherent in behavior change interventions. For example, someone goes and, and wants to learn meditation. Okay, they wanna go learn meditation. Well, what does that do? Uh, what does meditation do for them? Well, it's supposed to cause them to feel more calm and more relaxed and deal with stress of the life in a better way and, and on and on. Lots of wonderful things are supposed to happen. But how do we learn how to do this meditation process? Well, we sit down and we go to a teacher or we do something online and we pay attention to our breathing. And are we breathing correctly? Well, who knows if we're breathing correctly? You know, they said to take a deep breath. Well, I take this huge deep breath and I, and I blow it out and I take another huge deep breath. And after the third or fourth breath, I'm feeling dizzy and lightheaded because I'm hyperventilating. Well, that means I'm not breathing correctly and so on. So with feedback, we can go right to the point where we want to be. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. So how do I know if I'm really meditating? Well, I can get feedback. So here we have an example of somebody who's gotten that feedback, okay? When they were doing this training session, this is a training session. Uh, they were initially, uh, they were given uh, a sound tone that indicated whether they were producing the EEG frequency associated with this meditative state, which is six to nine Hertz. And uh, all the other frequencies, they were given other uh, tones to indicate that they were producing too much uh, beta activity or fast beta activity associated with being having busy brain. And if they were getting too deep and possibly uh, getting sleepy. And so this is an initial uh, uh, slide showing the uh, beginning of the session. And when we start the session, we should see a nice peak of activity here at about 10 hertz. We're seeing a little bit of it over here on the right, but not much on the left. There's a lot of activity, especially up in the beta frequencies. So this client is busy thinking about things, very anxious client, uh, worrying about things all the time. Uh, so we see a lot of activity up here in the fast uh, area. And uh, her temperature is kind of cold. Uh, her temperature, skin temperature measured from the small finger of the non-dominant hand is 79, basically 80 degrees. That's pretty cold. Your skin temperature should be about 90 degrees or above, and hers is about 80. Uh, also, we're measuring skin resistance, which is sweat gland activity, galvanic skin response, if you like. In this case, it's measured as uh, resistance rather than conductance, so higher is drier. The higher the number, the more relaxed the person is, the calmer this, the autonomic nervous system. And so um, we have uh, the uh, some of the uh, P3 plus P4, there's two locations, we're measuring six to nine hertz activity is nine, almost 10 microvolts. Uh, eight to 12 hertz alpha is about 10 microvolts also. It should be about 20 microvolts, ideally, with the eyes closed, and it's not because this person doesn't produce that much alpha activity because she has a difficult time dropping into that state where her brain is offline and resting and not processing information. So she's busy processing information. As the session progresses, she begins to produce a nice alpha response. You see that nice peak there? Now it's running a little bit slow because she's also starting to get more relaxed. So as the person becomes more relaxed and a bit drowsy, the EEG activity that is in the alpha frequency band of eight to 12 Hertz shifts away from 10 Hertz and moves down towards a slower frequency. So she's really at about eight and a half, nine Hertz here, which is nice. And you see that the, uh, uh, voltage has gone up above uh, 20 microvolts. Remember, it was about 10 microvolts before. Now it's above 20 microvolts. It's almost 25 microvolts. Uh, and the 6 to 9 hertz activity also has gone up quite markedly. So that's good. The other thing that's happened is that her GSR, uh, her skin resistance, basal skin resistance, has gone up. Uh, not a lot, but a little bit. She's above 100. And her skin temperature is hanging out about the same place, right about 80, although it's gone up a, a hair. Uh, as we progress through the session, um, we see that uh, she's producing a much higher amplitude activity here down here at about the eight uh, hertz range. 
And so these tall peaks indicate a lot more activity in that frequency band. So there are more neurons firing synchronously in that frequency. The voltage of the EEG at a particular frequency represents the number of neurons firing synchronously in that frequency. So this tells us that more of her brain is firing synchronously in that frequency. Now look up here, we remember we saw a whole bunch of activity in this fast beta frequency uh, range at the beginning. Well, that's pretty much gone away completely because she's no longer um, worrying about things. She has, doesn't have that busy brain anymore. Uh, the GSR, the skin resistance has doubled, more than doubled uh, up to almost, she's getting close to 300, which is good. And her temperature, her skin temperature is up to 90 degrees, uh, which is uh, within normal limits rather than being at 80 degrees. So a nice 10 degree temperature increase indicating that her sympathetic nervous system has calmed down, her parasympathetic nervous system has increased in activity. So her autonomic nervous system is more balanced and reflects a more calm state. And she's in this relaxed meditative state. Now, she had had many sessions of neurofeedback before this, and she was pretty good at, at uh, getting into this state. She was still starting out pretty anxious, but now she, she, she used to go through a session without any change at all. Now she was able to get out of that busy brain, that worrying, that anxiety, and get into a state that was calming and relaxing. At the end of the session, she felt much, much better. So this is what neurofeedback can do. It can give the person instant, immediate, effective feedback that then allows them to change their neurophysiology in real time. So this is the final slide showing an increase in temperature, GSR, and a little bit of an increase in uh, the uh, six to nine hertz activity. So how do we know what needs work? How do we know what needs to be worked on here in this neurofeedback process? Well, we do an assessment and one of those components is the quantitative EEG. This is brain mapping, if you will, based on the surface electrical activity of the scalp. And we look at, uh, uh, this is a comparison with a normative database and anything that is in the red is greater than two and a half standard deviations. So we've got too much Delta and so on. And so this shows too little uh, beta in the front and high beta in the front, but that's in relative power. Uh, so uh, we, we don't have time to go into this at all, of course. <laughs> uh, this is a, a five day, uh, eight hours a day uh, class that we teach uh, through STENS and, and uh, to be able to understand these at a very beginning level. And so we can measure uh, differences from one point to another. We can measure communication metrics uh, from one point to another and so on. Uh, we also combine that with, <coughs> excuse me, neuropsychological testing, client history, client symptom reports. And we come up with information that tells us, okay, there's too much of this, there's too little of that. Let's say there's too much fast activity. Well, the person has a lot of focus, but they're missing the big picture. Uh, that's great for really fine tuning in on something that's really important, but it excludes the bigger picture. Well, the person could have much too much slow activity and, and a lack of fast activity. Well, then they're probably easily distracted by all sorts of uh, inputs. Uh, as you can see from this cartoons, uh, she's getting distracted by everything and uh, she can't focus. Well, we need a balance between the two. We need a balance so that we have enough focus to attend and, and accomplish our tasks, but we need to also integrate with the biggest, bigger picture. So that's all important. So the role of neurofeedback is to train the brain to produce the more optimum characteristics, whatever those happen to be. So, we may train specific frequencies up or down in specific locations based on that analysis that I talked about. Uh, we may train communication metrics between point A and point B or point B and point C and so on. Uh, we may train the general characteristics of states like I mentioned with the person who was doing a, a, a meditation practice. And we tr might train lots of variables all at the same time against a quantitative EEG normative database and that's called Z-score training. We're training all these metrics to be more typical according to the database. So 
There are other interventions that are loosely uh, associated with neurofeedback, but they're not neurofeedback because they are inputs. And remember, neurofeedback is not an input, it's a training process. But these other uh, interventions fall under the loose heading of neurotherapy and include transcranial DC stimulation, uh, RTMS, pulsed electromagnetic frequency stimulation, cranial electrotherapy stimulation, audiovisual entrainment, all perfectly fine, but not neurofeedback because they don't provide feedback to the individual. They are inputs trying to change the individual uh, from the outside in. And neurofeedback doesn't do that. I'm going to very briefly run through this client. Uh, here's a client who had lots of problems, lots of migraines, blood pressure problems, uh, generalized anxiety, came in saying that he had ADHD, but he didn't. Uh, and I would talk about that in more detail, but his assessment didn't fit with somebody who had ADHD. Uh, what he does have is a slow peak alpha frequency that's in the wrong place, and uh, it's running at about 9 hertz instead of 10 hertz, uh, which means his his processor timing is off. And so uh, if we look at his assessment, we can see that in the comparison with the normative database, it says, yes, indeed, he's got too much central uh, 9 and 10 hertz activity and mostly too much 9 hertz activity and some, a couple of other things. And so we did some training with him. Uh, we got the slow peak alpha frequency there. Uh, we've got a Loretta analysis. Uh, this is from the surface EEG, but it's a, a low resolution electromagnetic tomography, like a, C, a CT scan or an MRI or a functional MRI, showing uh, the red is two standard deviations or higher, too much uh, two to six hertz and too much nine to 10 hertz. So we did some training, bunch of training. Uh, after 17 sessions of training, we did a reassessment. He had better focus, better ability to complete tasks, better organization, less volatile motion and responses, fewer migraines, but his blood pressure was still up. He still had a lot of anxiety, still had a lot of resistance to new experiences, and he was still having a lot of migraines, more than he wanted. So we changed the, tra the training. We included more HRV training. We'd also been already been doing heart rate variability training, but we increased that and sent him home with a home training device. Excuse me, we did uh, more training with alpha theta training, which we hadn't done before. And we did a four channel synchrony training that we wanted to increase that cross frequency synchronization that we talked about earlier. So we re rewarded an increase in that. Uh, he had m significant changes, uh, uh, decreased blood pressure, decreased migraine frequency, less anxiety, uh, better memory and cognitive uh, improvement. His uh, peak alpha frequency shifted up into the 10 hertz range and back into the occipital a little bit more. Uh, also, the statistical analysis showed that that uh, excess 9 and 10 hertz activity went away, as well as most of the other excess activity went away. Uh, the peak alpha frequency speeded up and became more typical. Uh, and again, the other metrics that we measured, the Laplacian and also the Loretta. Uh, this is the uh, 4 hertz activity pre-training, pre uh, and this is the post-training. Uh, the excess activity went away, and that was uh, also true for 9 hertz. Uh, that excess activity went away as well. And we did some more training after that to improve some other functions that he was having trouble with. So, We've given you a brain scan and we can't find anything, <laughs> which is sort of a standing joke. Um, because you see findings or lack of findings, that doesn't mean you have problems. Uh, positive findings, negative findings all need to be correlated with client symptoms and history. Uh, not every finding will have a corresponding symptom. Uh, keep that in mind anytime you do any kind of an assessment, of course, because sometimes people have individual responses to their world and to their life that uh, are compensatory or that provide them with a, a skill that may be useful to them, even though it may be looks different than what we're used to seeing. So of course, the brain and the body interact uh, through the microbiota, uh, the microbiome in the gut, of course, and also through the glia 
The glial system in the gut uh, facilitates activity that produces neurotransmitters, neurochemicals that facilitate activity in the brain. And there's a lot of new research in this area and uh, that's ongoing. And a lot of it is uh, being co coordinated with uh, EEG assessment because one of the benefits of EEG analysis is the ability to um, track the changes over time. As I showed you, the pre and post uh, assessment of the quantitative EEG showed the changes over time. So how long does it take to learn these new skills? Well, generally, most of the research says it takes about 21 days to learn a new skill if you practice 10 to 20 minutes each day. Now, there's an initial period of skill acquisition and then a longer term skill consolidation over that 20 run repetitions. Now, if you practice every day, it'll happen pretty fast within about 21 repetitions. If you leave space between the repetitions, it's gonna take a lot longer and you'll have more total sessions. So most of the time when we do neurofeedback, we tell the client 10 to 20 sessions, depending on how often you come in and how much practice you do at home. So more frequent repetition speeds up the learning process. So here are some of the resources, the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research, the ISNR, isnr.org. You can watch the video, What is Neurofeedback?, which will give you a little bit more information about this, the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, the AAPB, and the Certification Organization for Biofeedback and Neurofeedback, Biofeedback Certification International Alliance, and QEG Certification, the International QEEG Certification Board. Uh, and so this is me, John Anderson, uh, Minnesota Neural Training Institute. Here's my website, my email address if you want to email me, and uh, the Biosource software location where you can get a lot more educational research resources if you want to look into this more uh, deeply. And so now I believe we're going to take some questions, if there are any. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Uh, amazing information. And I, I have a bit of experience in the area myself and learned quite a bit from this, really deepening my uh, sense of it. The first question is from Mary Ann uh, Mortera, who said, thank you for a very interesting and highly informative talk. I'm wondering about the carryover effect from the type of tra this type of training. So given that the training, I assume, occurs in a lab with controlled factors or inputs, how is the person supported to integrate the learned states into the context of functioning in everyday activity and personal environments within their life? Ah, excellent question. Um, the thinking that we have is that we're working on uh, underlying mechanisms of neuronal communication and coordination. And so when we correct the imbalances or the inconsistencies or the incorrect mechanisms that then they coordinate with uh, the person's everyday life just in a, a somewhat automatic sense. Uh, these are not really cognitive processes that we're working with. Uh, we're not working with cognition, we're working with non-cognitive subcortical structures that coordinate and organize uh, and control all of these functions. And if we get those mechanisms to work more correctly, then anything the person does, whether it's learning a, a skill or um, being, being in school or interacting with their peers, uh, seems to be improved because of the correction of that mechanism, the underlying mechanism that oversees and coordinates all of this activity. I worked for six years in a school of, uh, with learning dis disabled children and did neurofeedback with them. And that's what we saw. I mean, kids would come back to us after about six weeks of training uh, who had not been able to read. That was one of the criteria for getting into the school is that they couldn't read at grade level. And all of a sudden, in about six weeks, after all the interventions that they had been receiving before that, they could read. And they'd come in you know, amazed and everybody else would be amazed, but because now their integrative mechanisms between their visual system and their auditory system and everything else was working correctly, now that they could put two and two together, they could finally make use of the information that they had been given and they could read. Um, it was kind of phenomenal. 
Great, thank you, John. Uh, Elle says, thank you, very informative. And Marianne said, thank you for that clarification. Uh, another question is, is, is there much in the way of uh, a high quality research into the use of neurofeedback for chronic pain uh, in terms of long-term improvements? Another excellent question. I was gonna talk a little bit about research. Uh, we have a lack of research, a, a great lack of research. Uh, we don't really have any university-based institutions, really. There are a few around the country, but not that many. And so the really good quality research tends to be university-based. And we have a few of those going on. Uh, the research into chronic pain has not been done and needs to be done. Uh, there are a few studies uh, that, that have uh, touched on this. My own experience with chronic pain, I, I worked in chronic pain rehab for about uh, 10 years and with biofeedback generally. And to some degree, we used neurofeedback toward the end of that period of time, but we did mostly general biofeedback, relaxation training, temperature GSR and things like that. And that was moderately effective, but nothing that I would be excited about. Uh, neurofeedback, my experience with neurofeedback and chronic pain has been mixed. It, it kind of depends on so many different variables. I would say that any intervention that's biofeedback, neurofeedback, whatever, needs to be done in the context of a coordinated intervention with other interventions like physical therapy, occupational therapy, and so on. Uh, we even had a 12-step group uh, in our chronic pain program because of the psychological and sort of addictive disorder aspects of chronic pain. And so I think as part of a comprehensive intervention. But the problem with that is how do you study it? How do you say, okay, this, this was the component that, that helped and everything else was superfluous. Well, that's not true. Everything uh, works together and that's the best way to address chronic pain as far as I'm concerned. But then how do you ferret out what's uh, the neurofeedback part and what's the OT part and what's the PT part and so on? Right, makes sense, great. Uh, we have to wrap in about two minutes, but I don't know if you could say just a few brief words about um, uh, given that uh, neurofeedback, biofeedback is a psychophysiologic uh, mind-body tool uh, for people who don't right now have the time to go through full advanced training or acquire the equipment. Do you have just any general tips from a mind-body perspective to integrate the basic concepts um, uh, of mind-body medicine into clinical practice? Well, I would say two interventions that are uh, the simplest to acquire and the most powerful for the time and, and, and uh, money intervention or investment are um, heart rate variability training, which is something that any clinician can do very easily. There are lots and lots and lots of devices on the market. Uh, the heart math people have some very nice devices. Uh, respirate is another uh, device. Now, the nice thing about respirate for heart rate variability training is it's FDA approved for blood pressure control. So you can get, uh, most people can get their insurance to pay for it. And that's a home training device. So is the heart math, uh, a home training devices that the client can use at home to train themselves to breathe correctly. And it has a huge effect on so many things, anxiety, depression, uh, high blood pressure, chronic pain, and so on. The second is audiovisual entrainment. Of all those ancillary interventions I mentioned, heart rate variability, uh, or sorry, audiovisual entrainment is the very best and also works with people who have uh, traumatic brain injury. So uh, that's at mindalive.ca for Canada. So it's mindalive.ca and they have wonderful intervention tools. Wonderful. All right, Peshan, should we wrap up? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great talk. Yeah. Thank you again, John. We'll be getting the link out on our YouTube channel very soon. We'll send that to you and to all of our membership so that we'll get a lot of people taking a look at this uh, incredibly valuable information. Thank you again. Thanks very much for having me. Have a great Bye. day, everyone. Bye-bye.